Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of uh, Business Agility Live. Today we have with us uh, Mick Levin. Hello Mick. Hi everybody. And we have our guest, uh, Mr. Stephen Perry. Hi there. Hi, Pleasure Stephen. to be here. Good, how are you? I am doing very well, enjoying the sunshine at last in, in, uh, in London. That's great. So a little bit of introduction on Stephen. Uh, Stephen is a, is a multi-award winning international leader in creating highly responsive and adaptive organizations by growing high performance global change teams. He has a reputation for passionate leadership and creating global organizations with superior services climates by changing the way employees, managers, and leaders think about the business. And uh, he's the, also the author of Sense to Respond. Um, and, the principles are behind it, which brings about customer, employee management, and leadership behavioral change. And uh, he has implemented uh, transformation work globally at uh, telecommunications, IT, outsourcing, shared services, cloud services, and financial services, right? And she specializes in business strategy, organization design and change, architecture by integrating lean enterprises, business agility, and thinking systems principles supported by his work climate and adaptability diagnostic climetrics. So welcome, Stephen. Welcome, if you've got any breath left after that. <laughs> Thank you very much, You're very kind. So, uh, so let, let's, let's, let's start, we have, uh, so the format is pretty simple that we're gonna be, we want this to be a very free flowing conversation and we will go through, uh, you know, maybe back and forth with some questions and answers and, and try to, you know, instigate the idea around business agility as well as what's happening in, in organizations these days, right? Especially given the current climate that we are in right now, how businesses are struggling and with the whole uh, situation globally. All right, so uh, so the first question which, which I wanna go through is uh, uh, based on the current crisis, uh, many organizations have sensed danger and responded in various ways, right? What are the responses you are seeing in the market? Um, this, this is a very, interesting question and um, I think the type of change that's being forced upon us now while there's there's a massive tragic component to that and we just have to acknowledge 
that uh, this is a serious position for many families um, around the world. So whatever my answer is, I, I don't want to make light of that because that's going on. Um, the type of adaptiveness that's going on in the marketplace is, is not necessarily a marketplace um, driven. It is um, a catastrophe, it's an event that is driving globally. And that means governments, um, public sector, hospitals, everything, supply chain, every business imaginable um, is, is affected. And, and that is not a marketplace disruption. That is the pandemic disruption and, and all that goes with that. But coming to the point that I think you're making, which is what are we seeing in the marketplace? What, what I am seeing in the marketplace is the inventiveness is just let loose. And it's that inventiveness and focus on something really critical and dedicating everything to that, which brings human beings into the best of being human. They are enterprising, they are inventive, they are agile, they are adaptive. But I wouldn't want um, adaptive organizations to wait for an event like that to find out that their staff are capable of much, much more. And I think there's going to be a lot of learning after the event. It's just too early at the moment. Um, and I think there's a lot of reflection on understanding how we respond to something unknown. And really that ties a little bit into adaptive organizations, but I, I really want to keep that separate. I, I don't want to join the people who have theories about everything in terms of their pet theory of how to run organization and saying, you know what, this could have saved us from that. I, I, I don't actually believe that. Um, but if you want to take lessons and then apply them into the everyday life, I think you can do no better than to look at the thing that has been critical to everything on this, and that is the supply chain. And if you look at the supply chains, they have been agile and adaptive and lean for many years. And we've learned a lot of lessons from that, how they link up supply chains across the world. But even what we have today failed. And the issue with that is we are not set up for that size catastrophe. So that raises two questions. If you let's just focus on logistics and as a metaphor for everything else. What I, I see is there is no competition. The guys um, in logistics are working with each other and, and the whole industry. And they made odd bedfellows. These are not the people that you'd normally collaborate with. These are your deadly competition. Um, and the only way that you can think about that is inside an organ, an organization, is that companies inside the organization don't collaborate like that, even when they could in a large organization. They don't, it's still that silo mentality. And for me, the lessons about what brings out the best of people in a crisis like this and in um, trying to change your organization to do something more meaningful, purposeful, that engages the willing contribution and ingenuity of everybody, those principles are deeply human and are timeless, irrespective of what method you want to use. And I think the lesson here is we need to design organizations and global systems that bring the best out of people in spite of everything else. There's plenty of things trying to pull us down. I remember a, a remark saying that any jerk can burn down a barn, but it takes real effort and planning and collaboration to build one. And, and I think we've forgotten that. 
Stephen, um, you've commented there on the kind of inventiveness of the or people in organizations and how a lot of people are working together across supply chains and how you've seen a very positive, in some ways, a very positive kind of approach to this uh, pandemic and crisis. What about companies, though, that have taken a more tactical approach that have suffered during this pandemic? So for survival, they've started to look at, you know, layoffs, budget cuts. I mean, anyone in the retail industry is closing their doors, stopping. They still have costs. So they they make tactical decisions right now, and they're very short-term, survival-based, mm -hmm. instinctive, reactionary um, things. What do you think is the future for those organizations, though, when you look at how they've responded to the crisis? I think we have to separate out the things that they can do something about and the things that they they can't. So the conditions have changed, the, the starting conditions have changed. And at the end of the day, these organizations want to stay in business. And so just getting through this and come out the other side in a position that they're ready to take on whatever the new world um, will look like. Now, the only time that I would think about organizations that have done agile really well, lean really well, and, and have a lot of adaptiveness uh, by engaging the ingenuity, that takes time to build because that's a workforce capability. It, it's not just a mentality, it's a capability within your organization. And if you, over time, built up capabilities to change, move away from continuous improvement and practice continuous change, that's what adaptive organizations do, um, that you cannot um, implement that. You can only grow that. And those organizations that have gone down that route early on would fare better. Um, I'll, I'll give you one example, which is a famous Toyota one. In the uh, 2008 crash, um, Toyota didn't like laying people off. So what it said is, look, we're good at solving problems, which is what the essence of all the things that we're doing and involving people and collaboration in all of that. So they set themselves another goal. Instead of laying these people off, what they set about was making all their plants around the world much greener to reduce their green footprint. And they managed to do that in, in that time. So therefore, when the, the recession was over, their cost base in, in regards to energy loss um, was paid for all of that. So it, it's really how you can direct your workforce to something else. And I think in, um, in manufacturing, which we've had a lot of focus on recently, um, some of the better organizations that are people that are much more inventive, creative, and, and experiment by doing, which is the essence of agile lean and adaptiveness, and finding out. Those people with, those organizations with that type of people from history and the capability, they can turn their hands to anything. You know, so suddenly going Dyson, making ventilators and, and, and all those sorts of things. Now, I think for the rest of us in services, I think the new situation for people is throwing up a, a demand for services that we didn't imagine. So there's a lot of turmoil, but there's a lot of good stuff coming out of that. We could talk this whole presentation just about that. Um, and I feel optimistic. I just sense when we are not warring with each other and we all have this common problem that I believe in the enterprise of humans and organizations should be designed around the enterprise of humans, not around the enterprise of the business. Those are two different things. So, Stephen, that's, I mean, your outlook there is wonderful on the kind of positive impact this is having as well. What about on the more kind of negative side for the organizations too? I mean, a lot of those organizations have impacted their people already. So mm -hmm. the inventiveness and creativity within those organizations is impacted due mm -hmm. to reduction in size, due to 
trying to actually scrape back afterwards to have some yes. investment cash around. How can those organizations recover and build trust again in themselves? Um, it's different in, in different industries. I think I was trying to give a good example by looking at Toyota, redeploying their people to, 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 to green their factories. Okay, because they reduce costs and the people are still engaged. It shows respect for them and, and they didn't have to rely on the government subsidies. But some organizations just look at what is the cash flow now and I'm paying this out and I'm not getting anything in return. So they haven't done the scenario playing about the worst case. Um, and they haven't built that ingenuity into the staff or the systems or the process or the organizational design to allow them to make that choice. They're designed on what I call that make and sell top-down industrial model where people don't necessarily learn to collaborate. They carry out specific functions and throwing them all together, that, that, that's a big leap in learning how to work with each other. And how to work with each other and do that big picture collaboration is something the better organizations are doing today. Because all organizations are adaptive to some extent, okay? But I'm talking about new forms of adaptiveness that business agility should be driving towards instead of being pulled down into the workplace thinking. We've got to modify that thinking of agile and, and business agility. Um, to mean what does that mean for the business and if your organization is designed around people as interchangeable parts theory x if you like then there's not a lot you can turn your hand to in that so i am afraid when the disaster happens it's too late you will default to whatever behavior manifests itself in, in, in the organization and some people are going to be brutalized by that and others are not and it depends on the approach to people that those organizations take i don't know if that's the answer you're looking for but that's the best you're going to get i'm looking for whatever answer it is you give me steve <laughs> okay mm -hmm. So you also talk about the, some essential elements for transformation, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, in in some of your some of your work in the past. Uh, is is the uh, some essential elements for for transformation from your perspective are continually understanding and locking to customers' need, real needs by teaching staff and managers the what do you call uh, the adaptive business cycle, right? And yes. building those unique solutions and experiences. So yes. how, how do you think the the uh, the engaging and understanding for the customer purpose business responses yes. you know, how how do, how do they all come together Yes I I think um if you see the usual chart um and I'm not criticizing the Bus business agility institute I think they're doing a, a fabulous job but the community at, at large I think euphemistically, they're, they're looking through the wrong end of the telescope. If you look at the list of challenges that people have, it says it's the leadership, getting the funding, then it's the organizational structure, and, and then it's the training, blah, 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 okay? Um, but that's, in, in those graphs, that's the same graph for just about any other change program. It's the same graph. But the interesting thing, it's it, the, the, the surveys are done by people trying to change. But they always come up with the same. When you put them into a graph and weight them by how who said what, it's the same graph. And it's the graph that somebody who is not agile, adaptive, but very, very conditionalized to think about, I need buy-in from the top. I need this and I need that and I need this and it's all I need I need so it's a permission stuff and and this really irritates me because that shows me how stuck they are because that is the old what I call industrial mindset I need permission I need to do that and in the uh, event in Vienna last year I I did have a go at some of the audience. I took a chance and I said, look, 
if, if Agile is good at anything, it's good at solving problems. So let's solve this problem of why you need buying at the top, because you don't. But you're conditioned to think that, when well, most of them are, because that's the traditional way that you change organizations. And if you change organizations to anything else using your traditional change approach, you'll get exactly what you what you had before. You're back in the same place and you'll say, this system doesn't work. No, it's like we have to change the way we change and we have to change the way that we look at work and the nature of work and who does it, who makes those decisions. And that drove me to come up with a, a cycle that says businesses are complex, but there are parts of it that you really need to focus. And if you can get these parts right, it will drive the rest of the organization to correct. So what are those core pieces? And this is where I came up with what I call the adaptive flywheel, because it, it is a flywheel. Actually, you can see it in the, in the, on the screen behind me. The first one here is when I go and look at an organization, I, I I really think about how they engage and understand their customers. Who does it and what sort of conversations do they have? Is it transactional or is it relational or, you know, or they just meet in the specification? Do they really deeply understand their customer and who does that understanding? It's usually a product management or something. But I'm thinking the more people you have that understand and engage with customers, the more innovation and more collaboration that you'll have. So engaging and deeply understanding and having methods for capturing what's going on in the customer's world and in business to business, that literally means acquiring the business objectives, not the outcomes, the business objectives of that customer. Not, did my app meet your specification? No. Did that help you gain market share? All right. Did it help knock out the competition? That's what you should be measuring as your outcome. And that leads towards what is the customer's purpose in being in business? Okay. Because traditional organizations will take the spec and just drive with it without going further. All right. That's a make and sell. This is what you want me to make, and I've sold it. And then make and sell organizations will define themselves usually by the services and products they make. And they're limited by that, whereas sense and adapt organizations define themselves by the value they create and are free and limitless to explore in any other type of product, provided you know more about the customer's business. And that way you'll beat the pants off the competition and you'll differentiate. So there are two other, three other parts to that, but I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you ask a follow-up question. <laughs> yeah, I, I was gonna ask you about, you know, many organizations are stuck there. You talked about kind of unsticking those organizations to build that adaptive flywheel. So. Assuming that pretty much most organizations are stuck, you have a formula, a uh, way of maybe helping them. But how do we convince them initially to unstick themselves, to see the possibilities, to look at business agility, and to look at how they can become sense and respond organizations? No, there's... Let's leave the sense and respond stuff there at the moment. Businesses want to improve. All right, they want to be faster to market. All businesses want to do that, irrespective of the method, okay? Um, so there will be something that's triggering inside the organization for them to look at, well, let's do Agile, let's do Lean, let's do Kanban, let's do a hybrid model. Whatever it is, it's the, there's a, a need inside that, whether that's to increase competition, reduce my costs, um, get customer satisfaction. It's a whole number of things, okay? But it's usually with the slogan of traditional management of getting more for less. And I say, well, yeah, everybody thinks they know what more for less means, but let's take a closer look at the word more and the word for less. So what is it that you want more of? Be absolutely specific. Because everybody wants more of something, 
And unless you know what it's more of, you're not going to get any direction. So being very specific about why you need more of it and what you're going to do with it when you have it. All right. And then this word less, what are you going to have less of? And some organizations said, well, it's, it's less cost, blah, blah, blah. But there's a lot of other things that are, you could have less of. So just initiating a program to have more for less, okay, quicker to market, all that other stuff. You need to be specific what type of benefits you're looking for because that will unite your purpose. And are those benefits delivering something to three critical groups and it's three critical groups that have to benefit without that you will fail that is obviously the business benefit which you'd have to specify there is the employees benefit and there's the customers benefit there are three separate purposes to why you're doing this and the trick is, is to combine all of those into what I call a common purpose, which any of those three people could look at that form of words and say, I agree with every syllable in that. Not the traditional one saying we value our customers, we value our shareholders, and we value our staff. No, those are th they value different things. They come up with one purpose at the top and they cascade it. Normally they'll cascade it like waterfall purpose. And that disengages people. It has to be very, very separate purposes. And as a business, you need to be measuring how am I creating wealth for all three? So as a business in crisis at the moment, most of them have thought of one of those three benefits. And mm -hmm. that's the business. What benefits my business? Mm -hmm. The customer, we need to have the customer there because... Otherwise, somebody needs to buy my the stuff my business produces. But what about the employees at the moment? How do we keep them engaged and involved when all they see is possibilities of for failure, possibilities for problems later on for themselves and their families? I think that's that's a, that is a very tricky question and I and I don't have all the answers to all of that and I'm not going to pretend that I have all the answers to that but but what I would say is this the whole point of adaptiveness um, which is what's being um, espoused by business agility and myself with sense and adapt is is you sense sooner so that gives you the most time between the event and when it's going to be upon you. So you you are sensing deeper and you are responding and adapting faster before that's upon you. Once it's upon you, you can't do much. You are in firefighting mode. But most organizations work in firefighting mode even when there's not a crisis. So I think the answer to your question about people that are involved in this environment at the moment is it, it will pass. Um, but it, it, for a lot of people, it's going to be painful. Um, not just losing loved ones, but losing livelihoods. And I, I you know, I, I live in Hertfordshire and I go through some of the, the towns and villages and all the little businesses that are closed up. And the last time I went, I, I was I was weeping because I they were not gonna open up again. Not all of them will be back. Because and at least the government is trying to cushion that, but it's 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 terrible. What I would say is try and find something else to do that you can add value with. Um, I have enrolled on a couple of um, university courses and I'm retraining myself at the moment to do stuff like this. Um, and I'm using that time to prepare me for when the market turns up because 
it's ironic if you say, well, Stephen, you're into sense and adapt and um, you're not adapting. Well, I am adapting. I'm actually changing my business model to something that I've been intending to do. But I wasn't quick enough. All right. So I wasn't taking my own medicine in that. All right. But you have to have that discipline to step forward before others. And to those individuals, just learn, set yourself learning, reading, taking online classes. There's so much stuff online at the moment. All, um, all these universities um, put all their material out there. It's been out there for a while. You can take the, the same degree courses on any subject that you like from some of the best universities in the world. Just look at what you want to do. This is a time to look back to your passion should be your purpose. And that might give you some hope and direction while we're going through hell. I think it was Winston Churchill said, when you find yourself going through hell, don't stop. I don't know if that helps. I, I think those are wise words. That, uh, I think it, for some it is a good opportunity to think about what the future will bring for them. Hand over to yes. Mano, I believe he has something for us. Yeah, so I, mean, I was just going to get into a tangent, what you were talking about earlier about the companies. Um, uh, one thing you two uh, talk about is is uh, the thinking, feelings, and perceptions, right? So mm -hmm. from that perspective, why do you think uh, work, the climate of the work or the work climate is, is more important than the culture itself in companies? Yes, um, I've been working with universities for, for many years now, and... Um, I accidentally stumbled across this um, this phrase, work climate, We're working with a number of them. And it's what it feels like in work. Um, and humans are extremely sensitive and perceptive about what you can and cannot do at work, how you stay safe, how you survive, how you get on, how much work can, you know, how much autonomy you've got. They, they, they do that. So this is the best instrument for decoding what it's like to work. And what I developed with um, Dr. Gary Fisher, who at the time was with the London School of Economics, he's at Warwick University now, um, is a work climate diagnostic. And I was looking for a diagnostic that, that, that would show that the thinking, feelings, and perceptions of people were fundamentally changing when you introduced different types of change. Because everybody says, oh, we changed the culture and, and all of that. But I had never seen anything, any research which really pinned it down. And after a number of years of working, we had pit, picked out a number of um, critical behaviors that create adaptive organizations. And this is down to the philosophy espoused by agile, business agility, lean, Kanban. It is how we treat people. And we are back to that because it just feels different in work. Um, so we said, well, how does those, how do those feelings manifest themselves? And we came up with this thing, culture, Climate and a climate is quite simply the combined perceptions of managers, leaders, and staff, how they perceive that. And that climate, you can then reverse engineer it and saying, well, if people are feeling this, where does that derive from? It could be the reward recognition system, the, the, the design of the job, the levels of autonomy, but what the climate measure did after a number of years because we experimented with this was when I was at um, my last corporate employment where we did do sense and respond as it was then. Um, I rather disappointingly found out that we'd run this big program and 50% of the work that we did was either useless or made it worse. But the thing was, like the old marketing joke, 50% of our marketing works, but we don't know which 50%. So that took another year, a couple of years, to 
to figure out which 50% that was. And from the diagnostic now, usually a corporate transformation can take anything up to say five years to change that with the culture. Um, now by looking at climate and using climate measures to then determine which part of the business has climate that isn't conducive to adaptiveness and to, um, to the right environment of creating willing contribution and collaboration from people. If you don't have that, if you implement agile, you're just making the old model go faster and ending up with cheaper need to faster waste. You know, whereas if you're doing it with adaptiveness, you are really transforming your business to serve customers and locking it, locking on to that. And you can see this in the thinking, feelings, and behaviors. The trick was, is how do we create a diagnostic to do that and a framework? And after about eight years, we've managed to do that. And my transformation time now is down to 18 months on a very large organization. If you think of the metaphor of climate, um, if you think about Europe, for instance, Europe has a climate, but it's all different. But then you'll say, well, each of these countries has a different climate. But if you think about all of Europe as a global business, and then the countries as different business units, and then you'll say, okay, there's a combined perceptions, feelings that give, up, give rise to this climate in these different countries, but it sort of all adds up. And then you want to go down into the business unit, into departments and teams. You can't go below it. So this is what happens with the climate. We do it online. People will answer questions and we can work out where those climates are conducive to, the, to, to really engineering good acceptance and working with there and also where it's difficult. And you also do it there as well. You do both. It's really important. Stephen, I have a question about responsibility. And it's, you've talked about, um, you know, going into employees and uh, going into uh, companies and finding challenges there. You've talked about how we can change the way businesses do things. But you've also talked about those kind of opportunities we have now during this crisis to retrain, to take advantage of universities and education. And then you've talked about going into the climate of an organization or even if it's a continental Europe and the yeah. differences we have as kind of business units in that and coming down to the team level. But what's my responsibility in all this, you know, as an employee, as somebody who's looking for those options in the future, what's my responsibility going forward? Um, I think that's, that's a really good question. And I'll, and I'll tell you why, because that is the problem that you have to start addressing right at the start because most people have been conditioned to think it's the manager's job or it's something else it's the other depart department so it's 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 never me too <laughs> i don't mean that in the sense it's others that um are always the problem and <clears throat> the real answer to that is it's everybody's problem from the executive down to the frontline staff and the organizations are designed to keep them in their place to do that. So the, very, the, the organizational mechanics and dynamics are designed to remove certain responsibilities and, and apportion them. And I characterize this by saying, look, in, in one climate, which be this make and sell, you know, everything is forbidden unless I give you permission says the manager so you're not going to be very inventive and try things out that's going to be quite a coercive top-down um, fearful environment whereas in an adaptive real business agility organization needs to be thinking that everything is permitted unless it's forbidden and, and you can just as a thought experiment feel what that would be like in one, you have no responsibility, you're not encouraged, and the other one, you are. So as part of kind of a, you know, if it's an old legacy organization that's very much been a top down from the start, I've seen where they've now told people it's your responsibility 
and your KPIs are actually to go learn some stuff and retrain and change your way of doing it, but without actually giving you somewhere to go in that in that uh, frame. So how do we balance that with an organization by enabling people to take personal responsibility and learn stuff and encourage them to do some do so without actually forcing them to do it or telling them it's part of their their KPIs? What will prevent them taking that responsibility is, is how, what's their perception of the climate. Some people will confuse that with, with culture, all right? Uh, there is a very important distinction by, by, between those, and we might come on to that later. Um, if they feel that the management are telling the truth, that if I go and do this work and spend some time on that, that I'm not going to fall foul of those other measurements, that I've got because it's all right giving me measurements to go and learn, but I've got to hit those those siloed targets, where, which forces me to do all the busy, busy bang bang stuff, as I call it. Okay, so which is going to win? It's the person who does your appraisal that wins. Okay, and it's telling people to go and learn something when they know full well that there is no trust in management. Because if there's a legacy of, of management not being trusted because of things in the past, like some of the things you mentioned just now, and some of those people that are working for organizations that just want to lay them off and do, do things, they've learned some big lessons about what it feels like um, to be a cog. in the I remember one salesperson saying to me when he was made redundant once and he was one of the best this company had and i was amazed that they got rid of it and, and he was quite upset about this and i said why are you going rob and he said look Stephen." he said if you want to know how much this corporation thinks of you there's a simple test go and get a bucket of water put your hand in pull your hand out and the hole that's left is how much you'll be missed and that's really sad, but he was right on. He was right on. Mm. Okay. So how these organisations are behaving towards their staff, people are learning. You know, I don't want to work for a company like that. I might have a career, but if you can cut it short like that, and I'm not valued, my work's not meaningless. I'm a throwaway part, and and therefore, the current crises is going to be a big reality awakening of what's important of being at work, how much time I spend at work. And I think this is really the exciting part because the workforce has been changing for such a long time anyway. There's a lot more individuals and entrepreneurs and I think it's going up. So Stephen, I think we're coming up with about five minutes left. Um, sure. If you were to give somebody advice, you know, working in an organization, so I now have my personal responsibility, I should learn stuff. How should I take advantage of the current situation where I'm at in an organization? I, that, that, there's a couple of things I want to untangle with that. It's a good question, but there are a number of dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, you don't give responsibility. You don't command it. You don't give empowerment. You don't hear managers asking for responsibility or asking for empowerment. So why should that be any different to the staff? You just design better jobs and you make it such an environment that they willingly take on extra responsibility because it's great. But you've got, to, you've got to get management out of that space. You've got to get management to do management, which is the strategy. Get your strategy right. What's your go-to-market strategy? What's your competitive basis? And be absolutely clear. Then what is my operating strategy? Some would call that the operating model. The operating strategy is how it works, what structures we put in place, okay? And then what are the structures within that organization in terms of governance and measurement? And they need to be focused on rather than getting the biggest bang for the buck, command and control, 
management focus on staff utilization, work intensification, cost reductions, and then performance targets around that. No, if you really want to be highly adaptive, make a difference uh, to your employees, your customers, and your shareholders, the management focus is related to them helping design new products, new services, co-creating with customers, and that's a completely different mindset. But the focus of management has to change. You can't have one saying, I'm looking at staff utilization, doing so many widgets per day, doing so many lines of code per day, all of that, and it's cost reduction, and putting my utilization levels up over the 90%. It, that's just real old mechanical world. We've gone past that. It's really about co-creation and we have to train the management to value and reward other things. And then you create the space for people to step into. But first, they won't step into that space you've created until one thing has happened. And that one thing is that management has to become trustworthy first. It's not the same as trust. I, you can trust me now. No, you have to prove you are trustworthy. And that <clears throat> is the job of management. Fantastic. Thank you. Yep. For that. That's end-to-end -end collaboration and top-to-bottom trust that we need to build. Right. Those yeah, are right. the challenges, I think. Yes. Yep. All right, that was great, uh, Stephen. Thank you so much for your insights and uh, your thoughts. Um, I'm sure, like, if we had more time, then we can probably do a part two sometimes, sometime in the in the yeah. future. <laughs> yeah, um, I look forward to it. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for for your uh, for your insights and thoughts. Um, and it was a pleasure, uh, you know, discussing and bringing some some insights uh, there with uh, between all of us, and hopefully people. Yes. Will um, yes. So on Thursday, we are actually talking to Jardina London on transformational leadership and structural agility. And uh, that's on Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, whatever time in Europe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it's about 1,500 hours in, in, uh, in the UK and about 1,600 hours in, in Vienna. Um, so, so looking forward to that. So do subscribe to our channel and... Uh, Send us questions if you have any. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very Thank much, you. guys. It's been a pleasure. Good morning, I really enjoyed your questions. You're making me think too hard. <laughs> <laughs> All of us. That's the idea. That's the idea. Thank you. Thank guys. you, Stephen. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.